Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, our weekly look at what's going on at the state legislature. We'll bring you up to date on issues from the Tucson area in our monthly series, Southern Exposure. And the deadline is approaching to sign up for insurance under the Affordable Care Act. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Richard Rellis in for Ted Simons. Each week we take a look at what lawmakers are up to at the state capitol in our legislative update. Tonight we get that update from Hank Stevenson of the Arizona Capitol Times. Back in business at the capitol every day. Uh, Diane Douglas, <laughs> this just happened this afternoon. What was going on with Diane Douglas and the Department of Education Board, the State Board of Education? You know, Diane Douglas was actually at the, the House of Representatives today, got a little shout out from the lawmakers as she sat in the gallery, um, and then she, she left, and shortly afterwards I had a handful of lawmakers come up to me and say, hey, you know, something's happening over there. And apparently um, she had gone and fired two of her top staffers, the executive director and the assistant executive director of the Board of Education. Um, it kind of came as a surprise, but there are a lot of shakeups when you get a new uh, administration in not totally unexpected that she would be firing people but there's a kind of a question of legal authority here um, whether she can fire those people or as uh, statute seems to indicate whether that's up to the the State Board of Education to to make those hirings and firings so we might whether the State Board of Education maybe she can suggest strongly to the State Board that the staff be yeah, shaken up yeah. but to actually just do it herself it seems like it could be a problem and actually right as I was leaving the office to come here uh, one of our reporters was on the phone with uh, former Attorney General Tom Horn who's also former superintendent of public instruction and, and a school board member. yeah and he seemed to indicate uh, that maybe no you you can't do that so we will probably see some developments from this over the next few days she was at the house then so she was received in the gallery she she was perceived as sort of a mystery candidate, even though she did get out and campaign in her mm -hmm. own way. How was she recognized? How was she received among lawmakers? Is she oh, standing ovation. I mean, you know, the, the Republicans in the legislature, for the most part, are very big fans of hers. You know, they're, they're no big fan of uh, Common Core educational standards, which was, you know, her main talking point on the campaign trail, do away with Common Core. So they really like her over there at the legislature. But I, I did hear from a handful of people afterwards that, hey, some, something strange is happening here. Speaking of shakeup. What's going on with the Department of Child Safety? They've already changed the name from Child Protective Services. Yeah. Uh, what happened this week there? They, they changed the name a while back, yeah. and uh, now we've got a, the second director in, I believe, less than a year that this agency's been operational. Um, the, the former director, Charles Flanagan, was fired by Ducey. Um, and, he, and if I remember correctly, Charles Flanagan was the man who sort of conceived of how this department would run. Yeah, he's, he's gotten really, you know, high marks from people on both sides of the aisle. It didn't seem like there was a whole lot of controversy surrounding this guy. Um, so to see him kind of fired at a moment's notice, it was kind of one of those surprise press conferences where the governor issued a press release saying, hey, we're going to talk about something at 2 o'clock today. And, you know, everyone kind of gets on the phone and tries to figure out what that something's going to be, but it's very tight-lipped out of the governor's office. And it seemed like the director, the former director, Took, was slightly surprised by this too. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there really wasn't a whole lot of notice um, for him as far as we've heard. Did the governor explain it or was it just a matter of this is my decision, I'm going forward? We're moving it. in a new direction was the talking point um, and they really wouldn't go in the, into any specifics, um, just a, a new direction was kind of the key. And, you know, the, the rail birds at the Capitol have their theories. Um, I think one of them is that it was purely political, that, uh, that, that the governor's really tight with uh, Bill Montgomery, the county attorney. He was not so close with Charles Flanagan, but the new guy, uh, uh, Greg McKay, um, it is very close with Bill Montgomery. So that's one of the theories out there. Another theory is that maybe there was something wrong, uh, something that Charles Flanagan was doing wrong. Nobody seems to have a real good grasp on this, but today uh, Mr. McKay issued uh, kind of a welcome letter to the staff. And in there, there was a line that said, any potential law breaking uh, ends now. 
um, kind Any of hinting at law breaking maybe there now. was some law breaking up until now, um, but we haven't heard any details, anything really about what this might be all about. Uh, the Republic had a story over the weekend, the Republic where I work had a story over the weekend that said the law legislature is not going to address gun issues. So of course this week, they addressed a whole bunch of gun issues. All right. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it was so some sort of Super Bowl uh, hiatus? There's been that theory kind of floating around the Capitol that there's been uh, like kind of a word to to lay low on the controversial legislation until after the Super Bowl uh, left town. I don't know if there's a whole lot of merit to that theory, but certainly this this week it got a, a whole lot busier with uh, gun legislation. Probably the biggest bill that we'll see this year, or at least the biggest bill we've seen so far, is going up for a committee hearing tomorrow, and that's the, the Guns in Public Buildings uh, bill that's been tried and vetoed three times in the last four years by Governor Brewer. But I think gun right advocates are saying, hey, we've got a new governor, uh, we'll, fresh slate, we'll try again. And is there any indication Brewer had the policy of, I don't comment on legislation until it hits my desk. I think Janet Napolitano before her. Do we know what Ducey's policy is on this stuff yet? No, not really. Uh, he hasn't given any real strong indications. And I've kind of talked to the gun lobby as well, and they say, we don't really know how he's gonna, uh, what he's gonna do with these things. But I think this, this year will be a good test for him to see you know, where he draws the line on the Second Amendment. Um, Jan Brewer certainly drew her line in the sand, and it, you know, Ducey will have to take a stand one way or another, saying that some of these proposals are good or bad. And now I don't know if you've gone through all the gun legislation, anything new that that might strike us as different? There's a handful way. of new stuff, um, but a lot of it is retread stuff, stuff that was passed through the legislature without any problems, but that Governor Brewer put her foot down on. I think those are the main bills that you're going to be seeing, the, the big headlines are, are things that we've you, seen in the past. And you seem to, there seemed to be something about internet sales, and, and we're all about to do our taxes, uh, if not filed already, but there's the provision where we have to sort of mention to the state how much we spent on the internet? Yeah, it's kind of right now it's it's uh, on the honor system that you tell, you know, the, the state how much you spent on Amazon products, for right. example. Which and you they, and I report everything. Of course. We should just make that clear. Yeah, I, I keep those receipts, certainly. Um, but so there, there's something going through Congress, or maybe not quite going through Congress, but that's been proposed in Congress called the Marketplace Fairness Act, which would allow states to actually tax internet sales. If you buy something off Amazon, Arizona would get their sales tax out of those things. Uh, so Republicans in the legislature want to ensure that if that does come online, that it does not increase the revenues coming to our state. So their proposal was to uh, whatever amount of money that internet sales tax brings on, uh, we will cut the income tax by that same amount. And that was actually the first bill of the year to uh, go down on the House floor uh, to actually mm. fail. A handful of Republicans kind of balked at the idea, said, y you know, this is years down the line. We don't need to make this policy now. It will be back for a second vote. Uh, try again tomorrow. Why? And so if this was the, why such a virulent opposition to it? I mean, was it because it's, like you said, it's just preliminary, this is so far down the road, we shouldn't have to deal with this? I think that's part of it, and I think the other part is that lawmakers don't want to say, we don't want any new revenue. Um, there are a handful who see, look at our state budget and say, we've cut, we've cut, and the real problem is on the revenue side, and there's certainly not the political will to increase taxes in the legislature, but this might be one way that, you know, in the future the state might be pulling in some more money. And I think people, the handful of Republicans who voted against this and the Democrats um, who also voted against it, say that's just not a smart way to craft policy, right. to bind the hands of future legislatures and say that, you know, we're not going to take this money. Uh, beer. And this hearing went on for a long time, it seemed, over the, uh, and it was a debate that was had here on the Horizon set over the caps on microbreweries. Uh, what was the result of all that? Yeah, this has really been one of the bigger issues of the year at the state capitol, uh, and it really goes back to Four Peaks, which is one of the big microbreweries here in Arizona, um, is hitting its cap on how much beer it's allowed to produce and still maintain that microbrewery um, designation. Uh, so there, there were kind of two competing proposals, one brought by the Craft Brewers Association and one brought from, from the opposing side. Uh, the craft brewers, uh, one big, they, they got their bill through committee. It was a, a committee where they heard both of the bills, or at mm. least they were scheduled to hear both of the bills. And then when the craft brewers bill passed through the committee, um, the sponsor of the opposing legislation kind of read the writing on the wall and said, 
hey, I'm going to not offer this bill today, and we'll go back to the negotiating table and see if we can find some sort of compromise. Is that, you know the machinations, you know what the tea leaves are like. Is that, how unusual is that for a, because he's a fairly high-ranking person, too, at the state legislature, Steve Smith. Yeah. How unusual was that for him to pull his bill? It's not unheard of. I think, you know, a lot of times they'll do it well before a committee hearing. If they know they don't have the votes, they just won't put it up. But there was so much confusion over who was going to vote for what. It really, a lot of lawmakers aren't taking strong stances on, you know, the craft brewers bill or the other bill. Um, so I think he was he was hoping and then kind of realized, well, they approved the other one. They're not going to prove basically the opposite proposal. So yeah, and the hearing was the running late. Minute. It was running into happy hour. Oh, yeah, it, it was hours. <laughs> last few seconds, any sign of smoke signals on a budget? I'm hearing some rumors that we may see something in a few weeks. Uh, the budget is, is, is done. It's just the numbers, as some people say. Excellent. Hank Stevenson of the Cap Times, thanks for joining us this Thanks week. for having me. Once a month, we examine issues that are happening in the other part of our state in our monthly segment, Southern Exposure. Here with that update is Tucson Weekly senior writer, Jim Nitzel. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, well, what is going on? What should we know about that will get us down to Tucson? Well, the biggest thing going on right now is our annual Gem and Mineral Show. This is a huge event. Uh, the major show actually is this weekend coming up. So if folks from Phoenix want to come down and check it out, uh, they can do that. We have a, a big event at our convention center, but the, really the whole month we have Gem and Mineral dealers in town with all these shows, 40, 50 different shows going on. Huge uh, event brings about 30,000 out-of-town visitors. I mean, I think them. if you haven't been, I mean, you think Gem and Mineral Show. But if you haven't been, this thing, I mean, Tucson plans construction projects around this, when this show is in town, right? This it's is a- the largest in the world, really. Uh, so it's, it's gems, it's minerals, it's fossils, it's jewelry. A uh, ton of people come into town and an economic impact of uh, about $120 million for our community down there. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you're planning on going down, you, you probably should make it a day trip because I'm not sure there are many hotel rooms <laughs> left available for you. But uh, it's, you know, we, we've got stuff from the Smithsonian coming to town and it, it's really a incredible way to just browse and, and you can see dinosaur, everything from dinosaur fossils to rare minerals to, to gems and it's just an extraordinary event that the entire community depends on because it's a huge boon for the economy. Right, and if hotel rooms are booked, I imagine restaurants will be crowded. So even for the amateur gemologist who knows little to nothing about this, there's still something for for the eye. Plenty to see, you know, not not only in this main show, but in all the little shows that pop up all around uh, downtown and, and elsewhere. So if folks are interested at all in this kind of thing, it's an incredible experience. I imagine some people watching too, some colorful characters that come down there. Uh, yes, absolutely. So it's it's well worth your time if you uh, want to make that drive down to Tucson. We were just talking about the debate in the state legislature over microbreweries, which have exploded in Phoenix. What's the beer scene like in Tucson? They've also exploded down in Tucson. Of course, we've got, uh, I think, Arizona Craft Beer Week is upon us, and uh, we're doing our part to try to celebrate down in Tucson. Uh, my colleague uh, Heather Hoke has a great story in the Tucson Weekly this week about uh, what's going on with our local breweries. We only had two or three until just a few years ago, and then a lot of enterprising people got together and got to work, and, and now we've got uh, uh, nearly a dozen local brews uh, coming out of downtown and some really cool space 
bases, some old warehouse bases, mm. and other uh, spots around Tucson. And uh, you know, they're part of this whole uh, battle at the legislature. The story goes into what's going on there, but also uh, a big celebration of it. So a lot going on in terms of, in, and of course, I'm sure there's a lot going on up here in terms of, of uh, crawls and whatnot. But uh, if you take a look at Tucson Weekly online, you can see exactly what all the events are about, but a lot of tastings and uh, beer crawls and all sorts of stuff going on. A, a friend of mine did a uh, pairing of his uh, daughter's Girl Scout cookies with uh, beers <laughs> at one of our uh, local taverns down there uh, last weekend. So a ton of stuff going on. Uh, and Four Peaks is the big name here. Barrio Brewing in Tucson, what are the names we should know in Tucson? Uh, Barrio Brewing is very big, uh, so is uh, um, uh, you know, it, it's escaping me at the moment. Um, okay. But Barrio Brewing is very big. They do the uh, General Ben stuff, uh, and they're just uh, one of the top ones down there. Yeah, and I know that uh, even some of the wineries have gotten together with some of the breweries down there. It seems like there's a big scene of craft beer, craft wine, this whole farm-to-table stuff is really uh, taking off. This whole artisan uh, approach to, to giving you something to drink or eat is really big right now in Tucson. And, and southern Arizona, if you get down past Tucson and go down to the Senoida area, tons of wineries are open down there. It's a great day trip to go down there and tour those. And I know there's a big rodeo in Senoida once a year, but when's the big rodeo in Tucson? Big rodeo in Tucson's coming up at the end of the month. It's our 75th anniversary of our rodeo down there, and uh, we boast the largest non-mechanized uh, parade in the United States. Used to be the largest non-mechanized parade in the world, but we got beaten out by some uh, elephants in India or something <laughs> like that. So, uh, but we're still this a, is a, this is a very specific category. So large non-mechanized parade. Yeah, exactly. So not no, no cars. Animated floats. No, no cars. Uh, it's all horses pulling the uh, wagons and and some of the floats and, and stuff like that. But no cars allowed in the parade. So it's has it it's always a, been that way? Always been that way. You know, for the seventy five years they've been doing this parade, and it's uh, you know a lot of people put a lot of work into getting this thing done every year. I've never seen it. How big a thing is this? I mean, is, are we talking about? It's the largest in the United States, Richard. So I, mean, <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> yeah. So so it's a good it's a good length. Where does it run from? In, uh, you know, downtown? it used to go through downtown, but that got a little too crazy with our modern streetcar and the traffic and whatnot. <laughs> we couldn't put all the horses down there anymore. So it's on the south side of town. It concludes at our rodeo grounds, and uh, that's also a big deal. La Fiesta de las Vaqueros is uh, a huge uh, event down there. Uh, tons of people come out to watch those uh, cowboys and cowgirls doing their roping and uh, and bronco riding and all of that stuff. And it's great fun to watch that and stuff. And some work for the people who sweep up behind the horses, of course. Without a <laughs> doubt. It's a job creator. You mentioned the streetcar. Uh, if people have again, if we haven't been down there in a while, uh, when I was down there last, there was just a lot of construction on this line. It seems like it's come in. How has it changed life along the parts where it runs. Well, a lot of it came in ahead of the streetcar. Uh, businesses anticipating that the streetcar route would help uh, in downtown. So at the same time they were working on the track, you saw a lot of economic activity in our downtown, which has rebounded tremendously in the last few years. And, and you know, there's a lot of infrastructure work going on at the same time. So it was a bit of a, a challenge to get into downtown. But right now, downtown has simply exploded in, in Tucson. Tons of restaurants and bars, student housing coming into the downtown area. Very vibrant vibrant area. If you'd been down there 10 years ago, you'd, you'd, you'd think you were in, in an episode of the Omega Man or something <laughs> like that, Last Man on Earth. But now uh, it's packed with people all the time. Excellent. So, I mean, are people, is it a success? Can we call the streetcar a success? Are people using it as a car is crowded? Uh, uh, well, you know, it's only been going for about four or five months. So I think the jury's still out on whether it's a success. It was, it was the first couple of months. You, you couldn't, you had to really squeeze onto it. Uh, I think it's fallen off a little bit. The, the folks are saying it's because students were out of town they, mm. they, over winter break. Uh, but I don't have any exact numbers, but well, I think it's, it's something. Whether it's whether it's something that's going to really bring. <laughs> It, it connects the university to downtown, so that that makes a that that's a vital connection to have created. It allows the student housing to go downtown. University is moving some offices downtown, so that's working out really well. But we will see. You know, time will tell exactly how Excellent. successful it is. That's kind of how we had to deal with it here too. Yeah. Thanks for making the drive up from Tucson. We yeah. have no time to talk about basketball. Oh, but yes, I that was that was a rough <laughs> rough night for the Wildcats, without a doubt. But appreciate the time, Jim. Thanks for joining. Uh, us. Pleasure.
Time is running out to sign up for marketplace insurance under the Affordable Care Act. Here to give us details about that is David Sayan, Medicare's Regional Administrator for Arizona. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. The deadline's coming. What do we need to do? Well, folks that don't have health insurance uh, have the opportunity to get insurance through the federally insured marketplace. Uh, we've got 147,000 people from Arizona that have done so uh, already, a substantial number of those in the second year, but we know there's people out there that we haven't reached yet and we want them to take a look uh, because the great majority of people in Arizona net of the subsidy could get insurance for under $100 a month. The story last year and media machine that was running last year, mm -hmm. there was a lot of publicity, but it was fairly bad publicity. We haven't, haven't really seen, I mean, because of the, the website right. acting up, haven't seen as much media attention now because I guess the website's going okay. <laughs> Actually, have we've you gone, seen yeah. have you seen an increase in people signing up or expressing interest at least in this? Yes, absolutely. We're at forty percent over where we were last year in Arizona. We've gone from seventy six screens to about ten screens that you go through when you enroll, and you can even do it on a mobile device now. Uh, so the, the 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 physical product is much more mature now and, and reliable. Forty percent jump in visits or in. 40? in um, enrollment. In actual enrollment? Yeah. What are the barriers people have to sort of, I mean, is it, to, to people believing that this is something that they need to do or, or should do? Um, I think, you know, it's an awareness issue. So people that have never had health insurance aren't really familiar with the idea. They're not thinking about it. Most of us don't walk around thinking that we're going to fall down a flight of steps or, or get cancer, but unfortunately those things happen. Uh, and the wonderful medical miracles that we have today are not inexpensive. Uh, and we want people to be protected about that, and that's what this program is really about. And I guess some awareness would come with the hammer that might fall if you don't have health insurance. Well, correct. There is a requirement of an individual responsibility payment uh, for people who can afford health insurance and don't take advantage of the opportunity to get it. Yeah, there is a, a penalty associated with that, and that is a factor, but that's not what we're really focused on. We want people to be covered. Sure, sure. But I imagine that the, now that we're into the time when the penalty's kicking in, that as we see the penalty increase, that might be a, like, why am I paying this? I, I should be aware. It's, it's sort of an awareness tool, although it's not, not being used for that purpose currently. Well, correct. But people that are filing their taxes for 2014 that could have had insurance and didn't are going to pay a $95 penalty or 1% of income, whatever is greater. For those who've gone through it, uh, are we seeing people stay with the marketplace or are they finding insurance outside uh, through their workplace? I mean, what's the, I guess how many, uh, how many re-sign-ups do you have? Are people okay. happy with what they get? So out of the you know, 170,000, 130 or so are people that were in the program last year and just stayed in the plan they were in or maybe switched plans. Uh, so uh, we're certainly happy with that and from what we understand, uh, people are satisfied with the coverage they have. Remember mm. that here in Arizona, 76% of the people in the marketplace are taking advantage of the subsidy. And nationally, it's even more, it's 87%. So people The subsidy that, meaning people who uh, are able to get government help to buy this insurance plan. Correct. These are people that enrolled in insurance through the marketplace and they're getting an advanced uh, premium tax subsidy that buys down their premium. The fact that we're underneath the nation, uh, that number is below the national average, what does that tell us about Arizona? I think it's more an artifact of the actual plans. The, the subsidy is keyed to uh, the second least expensive plan in the so-called silver tier. And Arizona had some very uh, low price plans there in year one, so that made the subsidy amount lower. It has to do with the way the plans are distributed in the state. Oh, it's the, it's the price of the plan, not just that we have... Not just the income. Okay. Right. But is there an indication that there's some uninsured out there who have yet to take a peek at this stuff? Oh, we're quite sure that there are, yeah. And that's, that's who we want to reach. Nationally, the subsidy is all the way up at 87%. And are the plans, if I've already signed up, are, are, have the plan prices dropped? If I have insurance from somewhere else, is it worth a quick peek before the marketplace shuts down? Well, that's an important and salutary aspect of this whole program is now we have transparency around insurance prices. You can compare uh, what you're paying, and that's an important thing to do. Overall, the premiums are a little bit less, 4%. Uh, in Phoenix than they were last year. And so there are lots of people that could benefit by switching to a cheaper plan. Healthcare.gov before the yes. 15th, correct? Correct. David, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, Banner Hospitals and the U of A healthcare system are merging and a new memorial to a former governor will be dedicated on Statehood Day. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon.
Have a good evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.